Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a real honor and pleasure to, to, uh, to introduce um, Sam Bowles. Um, I'm sure that, that all of you know him and, uh, and uh, know his, uh, his work and his uh, a track record as a, uh, as a researcher, as a creative uh, a researcher. Uh, he's currently at uh, the Santa Fe Institute. We we're just talking about, um, it gave me lots of uh, envy the description of, of how it works and the work uh, they do. Uh, eh, before that, he, he taught at Harvard, taught at uh, University of Massachusetts uh, at Amherst. He's published uh, in every possible journal you can imagine. He's been advisor to um, a range of, uh, eh, of uh, politicians uh, from Mandela to uh, eh, Robert Kennedy. Um, and um, eh, perhaps his, um, he um, eh, went to school in India and uh, taught school in, in Nigeria. Perhaps the most interesting to me uh, piece of, uh, of information that I didn't know of, and, uh, and he alerted me to, and it's in his website, is how he got uh, involved in research on uh, inequality. And, uh, and that was uh, thanks to uh, a challenge and an invitation by Martin Luther King, um, who I believe it was just a few months before he was killed, mm -hmm. um, uh, convened a group of, of uh, uh, academics to look at the issue of inequality in, in America, and some with his uh, uh, stronger uh, level of, of, of humbleness uh, acknowledged and recognized that actually in order to do that uh, once he got started uh, that he needed to know more and that's how he got interested and, and became uh, really one of the top figures in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the world of, uh, of, of inequality. So um, today he's going to be um, talking about public policy design when incentives crowd out pro-social motivations. There is a wonderful paper that uh, he recently uh, published with um, Sandra Polina Reyes uh, that I thought was really uh, a very useful and very important for our work. Uh, what they've looked is at the evidence on, um, on incentives and how they affect motivation and behavior um, and done it in, in a really uh, interesting and, and sophisticated way, uh, not sort of kind of the uh, simplistic way in which we, we often uh, discuss these issues. So thanks uh, for joining us and welcome uh, to the World Bank. Sam will speak for about uh, 45 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Great. <clears throat> thanks very much. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for that very nice introduction. Uh, it, it was kind of humbling when Dr. King asked me a bunch of questions about the economy. I was then an assistant professor at Harvard and I had not been a terrible failure in my grad studies. And the fact that I couldn't answer them uh, really made me rethink the kind of economics that I had learned and the kind of economics that I was at the time uh, teaching. Uh, uh, I want to start uh, with uh, a couple of um, uh, ways of just thinking about uh, the problem of incentives. Uh, this is a letter of, uh, from uh, Thomas Schelling. And he's describing his days in the White House here. Uh, I worked in Washington in the White House, the executive office, <clears throat> and uh, those were exciting and stimulating times. People worked long hours and felt compensated by their sense of accomplishment, and I believe a sense of personal importance. Friday afternoon meetings would go on until 8 or 9 when the chair would suggest resuming on Saturday morning. Nobody demurred. We all knew it was important. We were important. Sometime in 52, President Truman issued an order that anyone who worked on Saturday was to receive overtime pay. What happened? Saturday meetings virtually disappeared. Now, it's interesting to think why that might be. That is, we don't really understand the processes by which getting paid for something may sometimes have an adverse effect. Now, here's a rather different case. Uh, this is a problem in which uh, somebody understood that something other than financial incentives might work. Uh, so this is in uh, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and uh, there were a bunch of uh, uh, people not paying their taxes. And the tax collector, uh, instead of sending the cops, he sent a bunch of drummers. 
uh, to drum outside their house. Uh, and harried residents emerged from their homes to be told by the accompanying tax collectors to pay up or continue facing the music. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so on, and it worked. Uh, so now that's the case. Uh, Schelling was talking about crowding out. Uh, the tax collector uh, in the town of uh, Rajamundri was, um, uh, that's crowding in. Uh, so there, he, he was somehow mobilizing the uh, sense of shame or uh, maybe there was some residual civic responsibility there. Uh, now this, um, is what's, uh, this is a depiction of the 14th century Sharivari in Europe. Maybe uh, not all of you know what the Shari Sharivari is. It was uh, actually a thing exactly like what this guy created. I'm sure he hadn't heard of it, but in the 14th century and much later, in to this day in some places, women, primarily women, would gather outside the homes of people who were violating norms about prices or sexual norms, uh, often uh, uh, beating on drums. They often used uh, pots and pans. By the way, that tradition continues in Latin America, in Chile, for example, where you see lots of women beating on pots and pans. Well, that's where it started, and this guy was essentially crowding in shame or crowding in a sense of civic responsibility. Uh, and finally, third exhibit, uh, Packard, uh, he's describing here when he used to work at General, uh, General Electric, they made a big thing out of plant security, locking up all the uh, tools and parts. Uh, many employees set out to prove, this obvious, to prove this obvious display of distrust to be justified, walking off with tools and parts whenever they could. And then he describes uh, going to Hewlett Packard, said the policy at HP was going to be very different. The tools and parts uh, were going to be available to anybody. People could take them home, which they did. Uh, open bins and storerooms were a symbol of trust, a trust that is central to the way HP works. So these are all stories about crowding in and crowding out. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of mystery in what I'm going to tell you, although there's a lot of new experiments which help to pinpoint the kind of issues that the tax collector and Tom Schelling uh, and uh, uh, Packard were uh, talking about. Um, <clears throat> the, um, this rather sad-looking person is, uh, uh, wrote a book saying that um, blood donations uh, degrade the supply. It's a very famous book, uh, and it really started a whole tradition primarily in sociology uh, which suggested that public-spirited motives are crowded out by financial incentives and that as a result, uh, uh, incentives are overused. Uh, because we, if we're a, a naive social planner or a naive policy advisor, we're not aware of what Titmus knew uh, and we would overuse the incentives because they have these adverse, unanticipated effects. Strikingly, uh, how many times are books by sociologists reviewed by any economist at all? Rarely. This book was reviewed by two economists of uh, some note, as you can see, uh, and, uh, and others too, by the way. There was a, a very good economic theorist, uh, Bliss, and others reviewed the book. It got a lot of attention, uh, <clears throat> but they, they found it fascinating, but they didn't really think that the evidence was there. And there wasn't really in the book. Uh, if you read it carefully, uh, he doesn't really deliver the goods. Uh, there is little evidence that ethical or other regarding preferences, I'll use the term social preferences for that, or values, uh, very little evidence that they were important determinants of economic behavior, and even less evidence that incentives would crowd them out. <clears throat> now, this is no longer true. Uh, uh, a generation later, uh, or more than a generation later, Two things have changed. The most obvious one is behavioral economics came along and documented the fact that Titmus was, was right. At least he was right that financial incentives may crowd out intrinsic uh, uh, motivation or ethical reasoning. Uh, but also, we have a new theory of contracts in economics in which contracts being incomplete, meaning that not everything that passes between us can be written explicitly in an enforceable contract, the consequence of this is that we depend on social preferences for the execution of contracts which are incomplete, right? Work ethic is one of the things that sustains a high level of productivity on the job, even though the contract cannot actually specify the amount of work. A sense of honesty or truth-telling is essential in credit markets, even though the promise to repay is oftentimes not enforceable. In other words, social preferences make possible contracts in a modern economy in the absence of social preferences, we wouldn't be able to transact in many of those areas as efficiently as we now are. So 
social preferences, to some extent, play the role of being a substitute for the completeness of a contract where contracts are unable to specify the stuff that you really want. You want the guy to repay. You want the quality of this good that you're buying, perhaps a new program or something that you can't try without buying it. You want to make sure that uh, that thing is actually going to be reasonably good. Or you want to hire a worker and know that you can get a lot of work out of her, uh, even though that cannot be written in a contract. So uh, we now know not only do these things exist, uh, they're important. And finally, they can be crowded out by financial incentives. And that poses the dilemma facing the social planner or the policymaker, everybody in this room, including me, uh, what to do in the presence of that kind of uh, dilemma. Uh, now, um, uh, I'll, um, uh, this, is the, this is the real question. Did we learn anything in all of this which the policymaker could use in deriving lessons? What have we figured out? Uh, I don't know if any of you were here. I spoke uh, about two years ago at the bank, really presenting some of the evidence for this, the problem of crowding out, and so, some of the, let's say, philosophical or economic origins of the reasoning. Uh, and what I'll do today is I'll talk about, have we really learned anything yet about um, what to do? Uh, let me pause and say something about this. Uh, the first generation, the first decade or decade and a half, maybe two, of behavioral economics. Uh, I'm being a little unfair to us, myself included, but we really had fun showing that the standard model in economics didn't work. That homo economicus was not all the only guy around, and uh, that was great fun, and we got a lot of stuff published, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and experiments were designed primarily to try to uh, figure out whether or not the assumption of calculative self-interest self uh, could be sustained in light of the experiment's results. Now notice, we were not trying to figure out why people cooperate. We were not trying to figure out why people contribute to the public good. And least of all, we weren't trying to figure out what would you do as a public policymaker if the truths of behavioral economics were indeed true. Uh, that's not what we were doing. Now about half a decade ago, uh, my research team, we decided that we we're going to stop doing experiments. I'm not a good experimenter. Uh, we we're going to stop doing experiments and ask the question, suppose it's true. We think it's true. We think a lot of the stuff that has been suggested about behavior is true. Suppose it's true. How would you do labor economics differently? How would you do public economics differently? How would you design public policy differently? In other words, we started to ask the so what question. Uh, and that's what I'll try to convey here. Now, um, uh, we have to understand the mechanisms, uh, and um, we have to see why it is that crowding out takes place. Uh, and so what I'll do, and this is more or less an outline, uh, I want to say some, some things about the causal relationships. I'll be introducing some terms that I'll use throughout. Secondly, I want to review some of the evidence. Some of the evidence you'll see is contradictory, and that will turn out, ironically, to be a good thing. Uh, finally, uh, I'll provide a taxonomy of these crowding effects, and that will provide us all that I can give you so far as a basis for extracting some uh, evidence for how we can use explicit incentives more effectively and when we shouldn't use them, when we should use them more even. Uh, now, there is a message here. Uh, I, I think that I'm right in saying that the evidence so far accumulated does not imply that we should use incentives less. It may imply we should use them more in some cases and less in others. And it does challenge the policymaker to try to do like the taxpayer, to design incentives which will crowd in citizens' pro-social uh, values. Uh, and we'll have to think of ways of doing it that are a little less exotic or dramatic. Because I, well, I'm not sure. The World Bank does some pretty cool stuff. Maybe you'll hire drummers for your next project. But uh, 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 now, this is the, uh, you can see my, my model isn't ter terribly complicated. You can see there, there it is. This reminds me of the kind of graph that Ronald Reagan used to use in his TV shows. Uh, it's not highly complicated. We have some action, contribution to a public good, compliance with some standards in, uh, say, medical uh, care delivery and so on. We have some incentives. It's going to be a subsidy or something like that. And the idea is that the incentive induces a positive change in the action. 
Uh, we also have values, intrinsic <coughs> motives or ethical motives, and they also positively affect the action. And the problem is that the incentives may either negatively or positively affect the values. That's the basic problem. Uh, the, this arrow here is the direct effect of the incentive on the action. The total effect, however, is, of course, this effect here uh, plus this effect running through the values. Uh, and uh, uh, so this indirect effect is the crowding effect. A couple of cautions when you think about this. The fact that an incentive affects an action in the expected direction is not evidence against crowding out. Because notice, this effect could exist here, this could be negative here, and as long as this one was larger than that one, you'd have a positive effect. In order to, to determine from experimental or other evidence whether you're really observing crowding out, you have to have a model and data which tell you what the effect should be if there's no crowding out, and then you observe whether or not it's as big as it ought to be. Uh, now, crowding out occurs if the total effect is less than the direct effect. Obviously, the indirect effect is uh, negative. And so, therefore, we have this categorization here. If the indirect effect is negative, we have crowding out. And I will say throughout that incentives and values are substitutes. Uh, and uh, if we have zero, that is, that term doesn't exist, then we have what's called additivity or separability. And by separability, I mean uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, whatever effect we have here, this arrow here doesn't exist. So if you want to know how much of the action you're going to get, you just add this and that. You add that term and that term. Uh, now notice, that's not the real world, because that suggests there is no effect on values. So that's the additivity assumption or separability. Separability is simply a mathematical expression, but it captures this idea that this arrow here does not exist. Um, <clears throat> now here we have crowding in. Uh, if the indirect term is positive, and here we say that the incentives and the values are complements. Uh, and obviously, <clears throat> just, to, uh, just to remind you, uh, when we have crowding out, we have a problem of perhaps overuse of the incentives, and the objective is to design incentives such that they will crowd in whatever social preferences are there. That is, induce people to think about the problem in a way which, in which these values will have a positive effect and also the incentives. And that's because we want that term there to be positive. Uh, that's the task. You're going to be very disappointed. I don't know how to do that. But I do know, I, I, can, I, I can push you. You'll, you'll probably discover how to do that a lot sooner than I will. Because you're dealing with these problems every day. Uh, but I can, I, I can tell you, maybe, I can take you maybe half the way about the kinds of things we know and save you a lot of time in thinking about where you're going to go from there. Uh, now, uh, there are, um, I, I want to make two distinctions. The nature of the crowding effects could be of two types. If it's categorical, it just has the effect that if there's an incentive, uh, you act differently. It doesn't matter how big the incentive is. Uh, you can easily understand that. So, I mean, suppose that you're considering giving to charity, and the two states are there's an incentive to give to charity and there isn't. Now, you might feel fundamentally differently, and your neighbors might, and you also might brag more or less about it, if you gave uh, in the absence of any incentive than if you gave uh, with the incentive there. It's just the presence of the incentive itself that uh, makes a difference. But it might also be that the size of the incentive has effects, uh, so that a large incentive would have more crowding effect than a small incentive. Uh, I'll give you an example in the next slide about how this categorical versus marginal works. Both exist, that is, we can measure both effects in experiments, uh, and both are significant. Now, about the causes of the crowding, I'll say a lot more later about the causes, but I want you to distingu distinguish between two, two kinds of uh, uh, ways that preferences might, um, uh, uh, that might be affected. The first is, suppose we have... Uh, Suppose we see the incentive as a state. In some states, there are no incentives. In some states, there are incentives. In the state with incentives, it tells us, oh, this, this is like shopping. Uh, so, OK, shop ahead. Uh, you know, just maximize your utility. Uh, uh, so the incentives essentially turn on a mode of reasoning. It's a frame. Uh, 
And when you don't have the incentives, you may think of it as an ethical problem. Well, what, what ought I to do in this situation? I'll give you an example in which this is perfectly clear that's what's going on. That is, the incentive just said to people, okay, go ahead and maximize. You're free to maximize. Uh, but that's quite different from this uh, preferences are endogenous. This, uh, the endogenous preferences means if you live in a society which is using a certain kind of incentive structure routinely to organize most, most kind of activities, you will, or better, your children will, probably learn to become a different kind of person in terms of the values that you hold and the kinds of things that you value. Uh, now, uh, uh, there is also evidence here that uh, different kinds of incentive structures across societies are associated with different kinds of cultures. Uh, uh, this one is very long term. This one is short term and reversible. When people say, uh, remind me now, what's the difference between endogenous and state dependent? I, I, I consider my uh, co-author Sandra Polania. Uh, Sandra and I, spend, uh, we, we spent a lot of time in Italy uh, and um, we eat a lot of pasta. And um, so, uh, but uh, she's from Colombia and I'm from uh, America. Uh, and I used to eat a lot of potatoes and she used to eat a lot of arepas or whatever they eat in Colombia. Uh, now, so is our eating uh, pasta a question of state dependent preferences or endogenous preferences? You don't know. But you'll find out if you find out what happens when Sandra returns to Colombia and I return to America. If I go back to potatoes and she goes back to arepas, then it's state dependent. If I, if I continue with pasta when I am in New England and she continues with pasta in, Colum in Colombia, then it's endogenous. So that's how to sort of uh, understand that distinction. It's the reversibility, it's the time frame. You're really learning something here which you take with you for a while. Uh, let's think about now the question of uh, uh, the <coughs> uh, marginal and categorical. This is an experiment uh, by uh, Erlen Bush and Rukala. Uh, here is an incentive structure, it's a public goods game, uh, and there are three incentives offered in the game. Zero, uh, a low incentive, and a high incentive. I won't tell you the details of the incentives, but the, basically the idea is if you contribute more, you get more. Uh, the, um, the open dots are what a selfish individual would contribute uh, in the presence of each incentive. So it's, uh, they would contribute 25, if there's no incentive, 30 with a low incentive, and 50 with a high incentive. So that's the, these are just the, uh, what we would expect a selfish individual to do. These solid dots are what we did observe. Uh, and uh, so 37, 38, and uh, 53. Uh, now, uh, do you notice anything, anything odd about that picture? Oh, by the way, I, I noticed this. The authors didn't. Uh, the, uh, these guys are, he's a friend of mine. I said, Bernd, what's going on here? Look at that's a huge difference. People can dribble a lot more in the absence of the incentive than they would have if they were selfish. Look at that. They're just basically acting like they're selfish. These two numbers, by the way, are not statistically, statistically different from each other. So if you just look at the data, you say, what's going on here? These are the same individuals who, in the absence of the incentive, uh, contribute, you know, this is a lot more. It's 50% more uh, than they, quote, should have if they'd been selfish. And there they just act selfishly. Well, um, so we tried to sort of, Sandra and I did, we tried to put this <coughs> together. Um, uh, this is, the, the, these are the selfish individuals. These are the Nash equilibria for the selfish individuals. And we took the liberty of assuming that we could say that this was, this was a linear relationship and we don't want to attribute a linear relationship throughout here. Now suppose the person had this much social preferences. They, they're willing to contribute that much more than they would if they were selfish. Uh, well, then uh, we just take this curve, shift it up by that amount, and that gives you uh, what the individual would do uh, if they had this much social preferences uh, and there was no crowding out. That's additivity, right? That's what I mean by separability. This much social preferences and then add the, add the incentive and it works just as it's supposed to work. Uh, but what we observed was this point, that point, and that point. Well, uh, first thing to notice is the slope from here to here is flatter than the slope's supposed to be. That means as you increase the incentive, you're not getting as much contribution. 
that means you have marginal crowding out. And if you extend this back to the vertical axis, this tells you how much the person would contribute if there were an epsilon subsidy. It's there, but it's small enough to ignore. It's just the problem is that it's there. That's categorical crowding out. So this is the amount of categorical crowding out. Uh, they, absolutely, they, they, they contributed that. That's how much we predict they would have contributed at a vanishingly small incentive. And this down uh, sh uh, shift is the marginal. Uh, so in other words, the, we, can, we can actually observe whether or not it's the incentive per se or it's the height of the incentive. It makes a difference. Uh, you know, one, of the, one of the things you might imagine is if you're going to have an incentive, it better be a big one. If, if categorical crowding out is really a problem, then make it be big. Small incentives are going to kill you because <clears throat> obviously uh, the, uh, uh, this thing here will be the main thing happening. Uh, and that's uh, uh, what I want to draw your attention to. The, the goodwill, intrinsic motivation, social preferences that existed here disappeared there. Uh, here's another experiment. It's done by Juan Camilo Cardenas, uh, <coughs> an uh, experimentalist from Colombia at Universidad de los Andes. Uh, this was a, these were rural Colombian people. Uh, they were playing a public goods game, either with red, uh, that is communication, or uh, with blue, uh, uh, with fines. But here, uh, this is just a standard public goods game. They're not communicating and there are no fines. Uh, and at the, in the top here, I tell you uh, how much they're deviating from what a selfish person would do. Uh, so if they didn't deviate at all, if they just were per perfectly selfish, the observations would be here. These are periods of a public goods game. Uh, actually, it's the reverse of a public goods game. They're withdrawing goods from the forest, uh, so it's the environmental equivalent of a public goods game. And they would actually deviate by w withdrawing three units less than what would maximize their utility were they selfish. Uh, and um, so they play uh, for these eight rounds. And then in stage two, which I'll show you in just a second, they change the rules of the game. <clears throat> and the experimenter says, uh, uh, OK, now we're going to have uh, with one group. You can talk about it. It's just non-binding talk, cheap talk. And the other one, we're going to fine you if you, uh, if you take out uh, too much stuff from the forest. Well, these are the guys with the fines. Uh, they start out, they, 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 they said, if, if, if you, you have to deviate six units from the selfish or you get fined. They started out, they hit it exactly. But over time, they went down to essentially no deviation at all, which meant they became entirely selfish. The communication people, uh, they did a little better than they'd done before, and they sustained their level of uh, deviation from selfish behavior that they had before. Uh, now, this sounds very similar, right? It looks like uh, the effect of the fine was eventually to lead the people to act as if they were selfish. Uh, now, of course, it didn't mean that the fine didn't work because the fine changed what it is that a selfish person would do. So remember, this doesn't mean fines shouldn't be used. It just means that you may end up here just getting the fine to be working because you obliterated the other stuff because of that negative term in the indirect effect uh, was uh, a, a large negative impact. Uh, now here's, a, here's another case. Um, this one uh, is what's called a trust game. A trust game is, uh, is the following. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm the experimenter, and I um, uh, explain that these two persons, A and B, uh, the uh, truster and the trustee, let's say, uh, to, the, to the first person, I give some sum of money provisionally, say $100. <clears throat> and then you can allocate that fund, some part of it, including 0 and 100, to the other person. And it's then tripled in the hands of the second person. And then the second person can send back any amount he or she wants. That's the structure of the game. So thinking by backward induction, if everybody's selfish, clearly the first person should not send any because she knows that the second person won't return any. Uh, because Backward induction in a world of homo economicus means I assume the other person is selfish, I'm selfish. I know the person will send back nothing to me, therefore I'll send nothing to her. Uh, and um, now, uh, the, um, uh, this, is the way, this is the way the game is played 
with no, nothing fancy, I'll tell you the fancy stuff in just a minute, if I transfer stuff to you, you transfer that much back or that much back or that much back. And what that means is people are reciprocal. That is, the more you get transferred, the more you send back. You're responding to my generosity uh, as, a, as a sign of my goodwill or something like that. Um, I didn't realize it was tropical here in Washington, D.C., <laughs> even in the wintertime. Uh, now, uh, so let's, um, so they said, okay, let's change the game a little bit. Uh, suppose I'm person A. I can send some amount to you, and with, with that I send a message. I'm giving you 50 bucks, and if you send me back less than uh, 100 bucks, uh, I'm uh, going to fine you. And there's a fine allowed. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's, these are the black bars. So less reciprocity. What? We have a fine now. Not only, not only do they want to reciprocate, but if they don't reciprocate, we can find them, and they give back less. That's crowding out. That's what we call strong crowding out, because not only does the fine apparently have a negative effect, it has a big enough negative effect, so the actual reciprocity is less. Uh, now, uh, the reason why I'm showing you this experiment is because there's something very clever that the authors did. Uh, Fair and Gector. A lot of these experiments are associated with the name Ernst Fair from the University of Zurich. Uh, here's a situation in which the same thing that I just described is, exists. That is, I can fine you, but I can also renounce the fine. And you know that I had the opportunity to fine you, but I didn't do it. That's the white bars. Uh, now, why are the white bars better than the gray bars? It's obvious why the white bars are better than the black bars, because the black bar, I'm conveying distrust or hostility or greed or something. But why are the white bars better than the gray bars? You, gave, you, the experimenter, gave me the opportunity to signal to you that I could have been a jerk, but I'm not going to be a jerk because I trust you. See, I could have fined you, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, so that gave me the capacity to be you know, even a, a better guy in your estimation, and so you reciprocate more. Uh, I'll come back to this experiment. Uh, now, the last uh, iconic experiment that I want to mention has to do with uh, control aversion. Control aversion has been studied by psychologists for a very long time. Uh, and uh, um, it, it's often thought that if you, if you pay people, they won't do things which they're intrins intrinsically motivated to doing, uh, like, for example, kids painting and things like that. Uh, now, this is a gift exchange game in which uh, people who are called workers in the experiment, they choose a level of production. So that, that's the first part. They choose a level of production, uh, and it's costly for them to do that. Uh, it, so I, I endure a cost to, to, to uh, produce something for the employer. Uh, and that's it, basically. Uh, that determines the distribution of income between me and the employer. Uh, and... Uh, so the self-interested worker would produce zero. However, the employer has the opportunity to impose a lower bound. You've got to produce at least this much. Uh, and uh, so obviously, the self, knowing this, that if I'm selfish, me the worker, then if you're selfish, you should say, impose the lower bound. Because obviously, the lower bound will be binding, will actually induce me to, uh, to contribute more. By the way, the lower bound is enforceable. That is, uh, if you impose a lower bound, I have to do it. Uh, well, what happened? Well, the imposition of the lower bound res resulted in a lower level of production. Uh, people, people produce more without the bound than with the bound. Uh, in other words, people wanted to be generous with the employer until the employer imposed the bound, in which case they just worked at the bound. Uh, the uh, employers, uh, well, most employers didn't impose the bound, interestingly. The employers understood that they could expect the workers to want to share a little bit, uh, and those who did impose the bound made much less profits than those who didn't. And after the experiment uh, in debriefing, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the workers said that when the person imposed the bound, they figured that was a sign of distrust. So to hell with him. Uh, now, um, so here's a map. This is, rather, this is from Sandra and my uh, paper. Uh, I'll, I'll go through it, not line by line, but I, I want to indicate the main, the main points uh, that I'm trying to get at. 
Uh, uh, the top part of this thing is all state-dependent preferences, these reversible things which you can associate with the term framing from, from Kahneman and others. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, 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 we think that the, the incentive affects the behavioral salience of my social preferences. I can turn on or off the extent to which I'm, I mean, I, these things can be turned on or off. I don't know if I can do it by will, but it does happen. And there are three kinds of effects. Bad news. Uh, remember, in a principal agent problem, the principal, like for example, the truster or the employer, is designing an incentive to affect the behavior of the agent, the second party. Now, uh, I'm sure you, some of you have solved these principal agent problems for a problem set in a micro course. Well, here's how it works. I'm the principal and you're the agent. I guess what you, how you're going to behave for every of the incentives that I can uh, introduce. I mean, we usually assume in our courses that well, I know your utility function, therefore I can sort of figure it out. But in the real world, I guess what kind of person you are, uh, and then I impose that incentive on you. Well, what does that mean? It means there's no way that a principal can impose an incentive on somebody without re revealing what the principal thinks about the agent, how much the, how much the principal trusts the agent, or how onerous the task is. Uh, so the design of an incentive is, means information revelation about uh, the principle. And very often, it means bad news. When the, when the employer imposes a lower bound, or when the truster imposes a fine, it means I don't expect you to do the right thing just because you're a good guy. You're going to have to be bounded in some way or incentivized. Uh, so that's the bad news. Moral disengagement is a, a different case. Moral disengagement says, hmm, there's an incentive. It's just like shopping, forget values. Uh, now, moral disengagement has been studied, and the term comes from psychology. Uh, uh, and let me tell you an amazing uh, experiment. Suppose this were an exam room. Of course, I wouldn't let you sit next to each other. Uh, I, I, but anyway, suppose we have enough seats. So you can't uh, uh, cheat. And uh, however, I designed this thing so I can actually determine your cheating because I have cameras watching you. And now there's two treatments. Uh, in one room, this one here, we have just like this. In the other room over there, we have exactly the same exam, and the lights are dimmed a little bit. A little bit. I mean, still, everybody can be seen. They're just a little dimmer. A statistically significant uh, greater amount of cheating will take place in the dimmer room. Now, if you think that, I mean, okay, people may think that somebody can't see what they're doing. But just in case you think that it's some kind of rational causal response, try this. Suppose I did the following. Uh, all of you just did the exam. But over there in that room, I asked them, I don't know what reason I could give, but this was actually done. I asked them to please wear dark glasses. These are non-prescription dark glasses uh, in that room over there. They cheat much more. The ones wearing dark glasses cheat, right? <laughs> Uh, so what this suggests is that our, our degree of ethicality, that's a word that they invented, not me, our degree of ethicality can be affected by the environment. Now, the supposition is that incentives are like that. I'll show you an obvious case of that before I, before I close. And finally, we have control aversion. So I think these are three of the uh, kinds of mechanisms that are going on. Uh, and um, I think that, uh, they're, by the way, they're partially overlapping. You could have bad news and control aversion and so on. Uh, so, and these are the things which now, to get a little more practical, I think these are the things you'd have to keep in mind. Um, now, here we have endogenous preferences. I have a particular way of representing this, which I won't uh, describe. Uh, but I think this also is really a fourth mechanism. It's a learning mechanism, not a framing mechanism. Uh, now. Remember, fines work. They not only work, I mean, it's very important to understand there are certain things in a modern economy in which incentives work exactly like the textbook says, including a lot of the experiments that I said. That is, remember, uh, in, the, in the experiments, when you have the fines, people often correspond exactly to the selfish model. That means the textbooks are right, right? The blackboard is right. The blackboard is right when you're using incentives. You can have the same behavior that you would predict on the basis of the selfish model. Uh, and, uh, but there are some cases in a, an economy in which there probably aren't any social preferences to crowd out. I'll come back to that at the end. But here's a case in which we do have 
social preferences. This is a public goods game. This is a fair and gector. These are the rounds of the public goods game. This is the amount of contributions. Focus first here on the first 20, 10 rounds. Uh, each individual contributes. As I say, it's an n-person public. Uh, it's an n-person prisoner's dilemma. So the dominant strategy is to contribute nothing. Uh, that it, you maximize your payoffs by contributing nothing, irrespective of what anybody else does. Uh, they, they could have contributed 20, they start off by contributing a little more than 6, and they end up by contributing very little. This is very, very typical for public goods games. Sometimes it starts a little higher, but in these games it almost always declines uh, over time. Uh, the other dots, which are a little happier, these other dots are what happens where you have uh, uh, the possibility, they, here they stop the game and said, okay, we're now changing the rules. Uh, the, the way this works technically is uh, you're at a screen and uh, they say, we're now going to tell you uh, um, what everybody else contributed uh, and we're going to give you the opportunity to take some of your own payoffs that you've earned so far and allocate them to, the, to, to subtract the payoffs of others. We would, I mean, obviously it's punishment. We would never say punishment because that obviously is giving them a moral cueing or a moral frame. We just say, if you want to pay some money to reduce anybody else's payoffs, you can go ahead. So I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I say I allocate to D, uh, you know, $5 uh, to re reduce their payoffs by $10. And that's because D didn't contribute anything last time. Uh, and people do it very avidly. Uh, and as you can see, they start off at the same place, and it goes up. Uh, and now, right in, in these areas here, <clears throat> people are punishing like crazy. They punish a lot. By the time you get up here, people are contributing a decent amount, and the punishment goes way down. Uh, so, now, uh, do I need to remind you that this should be a little bit surprising, because what's happening when I'm, quote, punishing you, I'm imposing a fine. Why doesn't it backfire? It's supposed to backfire, according to this lecture, right? So far, I've been giving you a lot of evidence that fines produce inverse effects. So we're going to come back to this problem here. Uh, let's, let's ask the question, uh, why do we have crowding out in this principal agent game? This is the trust game, remember. When we have the fines, we have less good behavior than when we didn't have the fines, and even worse than when we had the fines but didn't use them. But uh, here, the fines work. Well. Consider the guys here who are finding the other people. They're acting altruistically. Uh, an interesting part of this game is, uh, in this game here, uh, the membership of these groups was shuffled every period. So there's no repeated game aspect. So I'm in this group, and I notice you're person D, and you contributed nothing. I take money out of my pocket, and I make sure that you get a low payoff. Next period, you're going to be in a different group. I cannot benefit from the behavior modification that I might have accomplished by my finding you. I can't benefit. So therefore, what do you know? You know that you were punished by somebody who was acting altruistically, not in his own behalf, but on behalf of some public objective. That is, to uphold a norm, to not exploit others, or whatever it was. In other words, the target knows that he or she is being punished not as a matter of aggrandizement of the punisher, but rather as a matter of the imposition of a public order that has some legitimacy. Here, uh, the, the principal threatening to fine you is just trying to make more money. Uh, and uh, once again, I asked these guys for their, uh, um, their uh, raw data, uh, and it turns out that the entire effect the negative effect of the, uh, of the fines, the entire effect is from the people who asked for the person to return too much, to return so much that the principal would get most of the goods and the, sec and the second person wouldn't. So when the fines were used to impose an equal sharing, they didn't have a negative effect. When the fines were used to impose a greedy outcome, if you put it that way, they had a negative effect. Uh, and so that's the difference between this and this, right? Here are fines being used for a generous purpose. That is, the designer of the fine wasn't making out uh, by imposing the fine. And here they were. Uh, now, maybe that's another lesson, that uh, uh, you have to think about what the intention of the fine is and who's imposing the fine and what's their social relationship with the others. 
Now this, I mean, talk about iconic experiment. I don't think anybody in this room has not seen this graph or at least heard about it. Uh, daycare centers in Haifa were finding that uh, kids, uh, kids were being picked up late, and so the, uh, <coughs> uh, there was a fine imposed. Uh, this is before the fine was imposed up to here. After, here the fine was imposed on coming late. 10 Israeli shekels if you come late, uh, more than 10 minutes late. Uh, and yes, you're reading this correctly. These are the daycare centers with the fine, and these are the daycare centers without the fine. So lateness doubled in the centers in which the parents were fined for being late. And no effect, obviously, here, because these are just control schools which knew nothing about this. A simple note was put on the door. Parents, as from Monday, if you come late, uh, you pay 10 shekels. Uh, notice here, here the, end, the thing was terminated, <laughs> not surprisingly, but the problem persisted. They continued coming late. Now, I don't really have a good explanation of that, but I'd like, I mean, it's really, really fascinating, isn't it? Because what it suggests is that something about the experience of being fined for coming late had changed the nature of the problem. So even without the fines, they now knew that it was like shopping. And even if, you know, and, you know, in fact, the amazing thing is they should have come more late, right? Because once they were convinced that it was just like shopping, and then now there's zero price for everything on the shelf, right? You, you know, you used to have to purchase lateness. It cost 10 shekels. And now they lower the price to zero. It should have gone up. Uh, so I'm not sure what the interpretation of that is, uh, but it is something, you know, this is just grist for the mill. We're still trying to figure things out. Uh, now, um, this is a, uh, an interesting counter case. Some of you know that in 2002, Ireland imposed a small tax on plastic grocery bags. Uh, it was preceded by a media campaign about the Emerald Isle and how it was being wrecked by plastic bags and so on. Uh, and uh, bags just went out of use. They just stopped using bags. This was a tax that was imposed at the point of sale by the, uh, you know, the, you'd go there and you'd say, uh, do you uh, want a plastic bag? And uh, uh, now, uh, the, um, uh, the discussion was that everybody just thought the plastic bags were kind of not, not okay anymore. Uh, now, what's the difference? After all, is once again, same, uh, same intervention, uh, uh, same treatment, different outcome. Uh, well, the two cases are radically different. Uh, in the case of Ireland, not only that it was preceded by a big campaign about the legitimacy of these fines and their purpose, it was something that you did in public. Uh, that is, there's a line of people there and you're shopping and the person asks you. So there is a, a deliberate act that you must take which says, I want the plastic bag, thank you very much, I'll pay a fifth of a euro for it. Uh, now, in the case of the daycare centers in Israel, not that many people were late. So if you picked up your kid late, you were probably alone. The teacher was there and your kid, but other parents were not. And moreover, it wasn't an act of commission. There was traffic. It probably legitimately was. You intended to come on time, but you really couldn't and so on. So, I mean, notice the sort of moral responsibility is a rather different thing when you're saying, I want the plastic, thank you very much, when saying, uh, look, you know, I'm sorry, there was traffic. Uh, and uh, so I think we can learn something about the sort of conditions under which incentives may work. Now, um, this is from the first textbook in public economics. Uh, and uh, this is a wise thing that uh, Bentham, by the way, believed entirely in incentives. He was one of these, I mean, he was the super public ec economics guy. But he did here have a passage which suggested a bit more sophistication. Punishment should be a moral lesson. When by reason of the ignominy it stamps upon the offense, it is calculated to inspire the public with sentiments of aversion towards those pernicious habits and dispositions with which the offense appears to be connected and thereby to inculcate the opposite beneficial effects and dispositions. Wow. That is so right. And notice what he's thinking about. He's thinking about endogenous preferences. He's saying a fine is an incentive, but it's also a signal and it's a teacher. It's a signal about what you ought to be doing. Uh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, these are charivaris. These are uh, shame parades uh, in China. These are prostitutes who are being paraded in public uh, to, Im to impress upon the public the shameful nature of their uh, profession. 
uh, I'm happy to report that these are no longer being done in China. They were discontinued in 2006. Uh, but uh, they are. But you can you, you can add. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of punishments which have been done in the United States historically, which are more or less similar uh, to that. Um, now, um, let's think about before I end. What's the problem? What's the basic error? Uh, and I think it's this. Uh, in economics, when we think of uh, producing, you know, buying, saving, and so on, we think basically we're essentially trying to get stuff. We're thinking acquiring things, which will be arguments of our utility function, which will make us be happy. Uh, but ask yourself, many of the activities, including economic activities, the kind of job you do, how hard you work, how you save, and so on, are also producing yourself as a human being. So you're not only trying to get stuff, you're trying to be somebody. Uh, and so the, the failure in economics to have a theory but whereby people are both getting and becoming is the reason why we've overlooked looked this problem of incentives. Now, I can't say, uh, fortunately, it's, economics is changing. There are a number of, of uh, papers, George Akerlof uh, and uh, uh, with his co-author Cranton, have a very nice book on identity economics, and there's a lot of work being done in this area. When incentives are addressed to acquisitive desires, it may dampen or close down our desire, our, the kind of uh, motives we have for what we call constitutive aspirations, what we'd like to be. Uh, and um, I think um, this is probably the reason. Uh, uh, in, in addition to affecting the costs and benefits of an action, and, is, and instead of also, uh, it suggests appropriate behavior. It suggests that you're being a jerk to do this thing the guy wants to do or not, or you're being exploited, or it may even alter the kinds of preferences that you or your children are likely to adopt in the very long run. I think this is a rather uh, informal uh, explanation of the kinds of results which I have just discussed. Uh, the um, uh, the, the, the fact that we have these uh, um, difference, different effects of the, on the plastic bags and the daycare and so on. So I, I would like to uh, think uh, that economics and public policy could think about uh, acquisitiveness at, along with our constitutive motivations as part of the same thing. And we're engaging in caring for our kids and uh, buying and selling and uh, all the kinds of things that your policy interacts with. Uh, this is, I should have automated this. I'm intended to. Okay, but here's, here's the take home, if there is a take home. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, if, there, if, there's, if there's no social preferences to crowd out, crowding out doesn't happen. And there are a lot of jobs in a, uh, or tasks to be fulfilled in a modern economy in which there really are not a lot of social preferences. Uh, I think of you know, cleaning hotel rooms or you know, doing very menial tasks and so on. The reason why I put this thing in parentheses is as I've studied this question and I've done a lot of, I, I teach crash courses in economics to non-academic people, uh, what I've discovered is that people who jobs that most academics would consider to be menial, menial jobs and without the possibility of any intrinsic desire to do a good job and so on, people in the most amazing jobs really feel the desire to do, it, to do a good job. So I don't mean to suggest that there are a whole lot of areas in social life where, where you just don't want to do the thing you're doing and you're only doing it for the money. Very few people I've ever met in all these courses that I've taught, which are probably thousands of people by now, uh, I would say are like that. Uh, now, here, here's the second take home. If there's a target, I want to have 80% of the people trained in this particular technique of, say, first aid. Uh, and the sophisticated policymaker finds out that crowding out is happening. You should use more incentives. You have to use more incentives because you just discovered that your incentive doesn't work as well as you thought. Right? So, so you, it, uh, notice that's because you're target hitting. Right? Uh, now, the alternative is you might want to drop the use of incentives and try another approach, moral suasion or something else. Uh, but there is no, uh, there's no, there's no, I mean, uh, the, the target case, by the way, is a stand-in for any case in which the benefit function for having more of this thing is very concave. I mean, the target case has a, like a step function like that, that's the target. Well, suppose the function, you know, was very like that, that'd be the same thing. A very concave benefit function will, will lead you to use more once you find out that it's not working as well. You know, 
That's not so surprising. Uh, suppose you go to the doctor and you say, you know, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm taking a, the thing you prescribed, but uh, I'm, not, I'm still feeling pretty bad. There's two things the doctor's going to do. They say, well, take a, more, take, take a bigger dose. He's not going to say take a smaller dose, but he may say, I'll try something else. And that's, I think that's the right approach. Uh, now, uh, incentives designed to benefit the target are unlikely to incur crowding out. That's the public goods game. Uh, incentives are are not the problem. Incentives per se, I don't think are the problem hardly ever. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, I think economists have been quite right to resist the idea that we're condemning incentives because we observe crowding out. I think what we should do instead is not ignore the problem, but we should shift back one step and ask what are the incentives for, who's benefiting from them. Uh, but if the, if the incentive designer's attempt is to control or exploit the target, well, that's when you're going to have a problem. I don't mean that's only when you're going to have a problem, because I think there's some experiments that I can't really explain this way. So there's maybe something else going on. But surely this is part of the problem. So this is my bumper sticker. I have a very big car. Uh, there's nothing wrong with incentives that respect for fairness and freedom wouldn't fix. Uh, that's, um, uh, I want to thank uh, my co-authors. There are a series of papers we've done. Some of these are uh, written in English and some are mathematical. Uh, uh, I, I, um, Sandra Polonia is not only a... Uh, uh, a fantastic experimentalist. Uh, she believes in uh, debriefing the people. These are uh, shopkeepers in Bogota uh, about the, how, how they do much better in business if they uh, learned how to cooperate. Uh, Sung Ha Huang is a PhD in math, uh, and we've, uh, we've got a, a bunch of papers uh, on this. Um, and, um, oh, I want to end with this. Uh, but I, I'm going to have to read this because it's so moving. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, it's about an expedition, and uh, I, have a, I, have, I have it written up here. I'd probably get it wrong. <clears throat> uh, I'll just read. This is the coda of a book that I'm writing. The, book, the title of the book is Machiavelli's Mistake. Uh, good title, huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I tried something else. It was somebody else's mistake, but my publisher didn't know who the guy was. Uh, <laughs> It'll go up there with Portnoy's complaint and other things like that. Um, uh, when in uh, three, uh, uh, 325 BC, the Athenian uh, Citizens' Assembly decided to set up a colony and a naval station in the Adriatic, far to the west of Greece, they took on a project of enormous proportions. Thousands would undertake the mission of 289 ships. Uh, they had little time to spare as the window for safe nav navigation en route would close in a matter of weeks. Neither the personnel nor the ships were at the moment under public orders. The, settler, uh, the settlers, oarsmen, navigators, soldiers, captains, and so on, who would have, would have to be recruited from their, their private lives, and the ships would be outfitted for the mission. Some would carry horses as cavalry were involved. Uh, we know how they did this because there was a decree uh, of the assembly uh, which uh, di uh, dictated how it would happen. Uh, Trirarchs, that's the ship commanders, uh, were appointed. These from private citizens. So you're appointed, and uh, you're required to bring a fully out outfitted and crewed ship to the docks in Piraeus by a given date. So that's the bad news. But if you felt unjustly burdened, you could appeal the assignment, it was called a liturgy or liturgy, by challenging some also wealthy person. So you could go to that guy and say, sorry, um, uh, I'm not going to do this because I'm not as wealthy as I should be, uh, and you should do it uh, instead. Uh, now, if the, uh, um, so the, the problem with liturgy was this. Uh, the other person had to take on the liturgy, or if not, they had to exchange property with the person who had challenged them. I mean, what a clever thing, right? Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, if the target refused to, uh, to do either, then there'd be a popular jury and his estate would be taken away. Uh, now, <clears throat> the, uh, the decree continues. I'm quoting now. The Demos is to crown the first trirarch to bring his ship with a, cr with a crown of 500 drachmas, the second ship to arrive with a 300 and, and so on. And then it added that the herald of the Council of 500 would announce uh, the, the crowns and these prizes in a contest at a festival in order to that the competitive zeal of the triarchs towards the demos would be evident. Uh, and um, all, there, are, there are similar prizes and so on. 
Now, lest there be any doubt about the elevated purpose for, of these incentives, the degree, the degree went on and on about the benefits of establishing this base in the Adriatic. The Demos may, for all future time, have its co own commerce and transport of grain and a guard against the Etruscan pirates. And they went on and on about further prizes and so on that uh, would, be, um, would be given. Uh, now, they, they had accomplished uh, uh, an extraordinary feat, notice by recruiting voluntarily from the private sector, 289 ships you know, and horses. Well, um, now amazingly, they also had problems with their daycares. <laughs> and records have been preserved about how the Athenians incentivized the parents to show up on time. <laughs> and so I leave it to you to guess what the Athenians might have done there. Maybe we can begin our discussion by, uh, and this guy's actually Greek. Uh, and that this is, uh, so we could, we could think about how would the Athenians have advertised the fines at the daycare. Uh, and, uh, well, that's it. Thanks a lot. Uh, so we have uh, some time for, for, for questions. Uh, please come to one of the microphones, briefly introduce yourselves for uh, Sam's benefit, and ask uh, short questions. If anybody would like to take on how the Athenians would have helped de dealt with the daycares, I think it's a fabulous uh, you know, question, but you have to have a Greek accent to do it. <laughs> I'm I'm going to make a uh, I don't have a, an answer to the Athenian but I did wonder if you knew about the moral code of babies some of this research about how like you know uh pre like one year olds and even uh month old babies have this kind of moral code that they've been, done done work on at Harvard and and Yale and showing how babies will punish you know kind of the bad puppet in in different dramas and so kind of just how you know maybe um this is part of our DNA so to speak and uh and then you mentioned on the um, uh, Irish bags, um, the role of media. I've been doing some work on entertainment education and kind of behavior change communication and wondered if, you know, there was some of your research that was really looking at kind of different aspects of, um, you know, how the media plays into this. Um, about the stuff on little Margaret kids. Margaret Miller, I'm in the research group. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that, that little, little kids, un, uh, you know, even infants under the age of one, uh, respond uh, morally in, in in various moral dilemmas. I mean, it's 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 uh, you can imagine the experimental designs are difficult, but we've learned how to do designs with uh, uh, with other apes and also with uh, uh, monkeys. Oh, you think that's funny? <laughs> I, I'm also a biologist, by the way, uh, and, uh, and 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 there's. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that uh, humans are, from a very young age, uh, evidently before they've been socialized in any, uh, in any major way, extremely altruistic uh, and willing to help others and to punish people who apparently uh, are violating some kind of perceived uh, norm, and that other, uh, other primates are not. There is a bit of evidence from some other primates, but uh, we're really, really distinct. Uh, that's consistent with the idea uh, that human beings are genetically predisposed to being altruistic, although the content of their altruism presumably is culturally determined. And I, I, I mean, this is something I've studied. I wrote a book about the genetic evolution of altruism and cooperativeness in humans. I think, it's, I think it really happened. I think that's the way it's, it really is the case. It's not an entirely happy story, but I think we should start with the fact that the, uh, the idea that somehow homo economicus <laughs> must be the way we are because natural selection is the way it is, is false. I mean, that is a mistake. It's a non sequitur, and that's the point of this book which I wrote, which has been, I mean, in case you're wondering, uh, well-reviewed by uh, theoretical biologists and population geneticists and so on. It's the, this is not, uh, it revives uh, an idea about human nature which is, I think, much more balanced. And as I say, it's not entirely good news because I think the process by which we got this way has to do with intergroup conflict and warfare. And therefore, we took on board a kind of altruism which is rather bounded by our borders, uh, the borders of whatever we call us. I call it parochial altruism, meaning narrow-minded altruism. I think that's what we're working with. Uh, uh, I, haven't, I haven't done much with the media because I've been, uh, been interested in, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is very primitive, the stuff that I'm doing. I, I wanted to try to figure out what the experiment said so far. 
Uh, there are people much better able to deal with the problems of the media and persuasion in the media uh, because they've studied it all their life. Uh, and I read them, and you do too, probably. Come on, you Athenians. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't have a question. My name is Louise Fox, and I work on a wide variety of problems related to poverty and labor markets and safety nets. And um, uh, I wondered if you could give us your thoughts about uh, the health insurance mandate uh, that has been put in place and the what would you advise the Secretary of Health and Human Services in doing uh, in setting up the exchanges so that al its altruism is crowded in? We know it's a market that doesn't work. We know it has adverse selection. So we know we have to do something. So what would you... But we also know there are uh, moral imperatives uh, around some of these issues. So what would you advise? I'm sure there are people in this room who have thought about questions like that much better than I have. Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious from what I've said that not making clear the moral aspect of the problem is a big mistake. Uh, I mean, you step back a little bit and ask, why do people support it in the first place? Well, they support it in the first place because they think it's the right thing to do. Uh, now, people, uh, uh, very, often, uh, very often people on the sort of liberal or left-center side of the political spectrum think that the smart political thing to do is to explain to everybody that it's in their self-interest that they may actually need this and so on. Uh, there but for the grace of God go I and so on. Uh, now, I don't think this is why people support uh, uh, egalitarian social policy or safety nets or uh, policies that will en enhance economic security. I think they support it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, now, I'm not just saying what I think. I actually wrote a paper about that to try to figure out why it is that even people of high incomes who don't expect to be poor will say yes to policy, to policy questions about redistribution, even when the T word is in the question, even if you have to pay more taxes, conditional on their beliefs about why people are poor. Uh, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of education. There's a cognitive problem, not a moral problem. I don't think the American public is selfish. I think the American public doesn't understand a lot of facts about why people are poor and what it is to be poor and so on. Now, I don't know this, as I say, as an, as an expert, but I did look into the question about why people don't like the welfare state. And I can assure you the evidence is overwhelming. It's not because they're unethical and selfish. A lot of the opposition to the welfare state is because they are ethical and they believe the welfare state is supporting unethical behaviors. Now, this doesn't apply so much to the health question you asked. Uh, and there, I think, there's a, another cognitive problem, which is nobody has explained the problem of adverse selection in insurance markets and why it is that it's one of the things the government can do and ought to do is coerce everybody to be part of the insurance pool. It's absolutely insane to have a, a system which is substantially voluntary. And making these little baby steps towards making it a little less voluntary just looks like an imposition on people unless somebody, and the president could surely do it, explain why it is that the insurance pool needs to be everybody. I mean, this is, you know, this is old news in economics. And everybody knows it. It's not a question of left or right. Everybody knows it. Sure. Sorry, let me, let me follow up. So, so if I understand correctly, there's two differences, in, as you see them, in, between the Haifa and the Ireland case. So if in the Haifa schools, basically, they had explained why it was bad for the parents because uh, um, so that they had explained sort of the motivation and underlying the fines. No, they didn't. No, 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 no. If they had. If they had. If they had, then yeah. results would have been different. The other thing you mentioned is, well, in the case of the, the bags, everybody knows that you're buying um, um, so, so you're making so, so maybe you care about you know the, what others what, the, what others might might think about it. So, so another another treatment that that Haifa schools might have thought might have might have might have uh, might have uh, implemented was basically to post a list of all the parents in the last week that were actually late, mm -hmm. and that would have had. So, are you really so yeah. that you think would have actually uh, would have would have changed? Uh, so yeah. it's it's not yeah. it's not about so it's not about monetizing basically guilt that yeah. the, you know parents folks I mean you know before I was feeling really bad now there's a fine so so it's not it's not really the the shopping uh, uh, aspect of it right so so now there's a fine so 
if I pay the fine, then I'm going to be, you know, sort of I... I, uh, I think that was the problem, and that's what some of what you described would, would get over that, because... Uh, okay, here's, here's what I wrote in this little coda. This is the Greeks come to... Uh, this is the tablet which I found. Actually, of course, I didn't find such a tablet. But what it said is, um, the Council of Parents wish to thank everybody for arriving on time to pick up your children. As this will reduce the anxiety of the children sometimes feel and also will allow our staff to leave in a timely manner to go home with and be with their own families. We'll recognize all parents who have a perfect unblemished record of uh, uh, no lateness for the next three months with an award of 500 Israeli shekels to be given at our annual parents and staff holiday party with an option to contribute your award to the school's Teacher of the Year celebration. Uh, uh, moreover, those who by any chance arrive 10 minutes late, however, will have to pay a fine of 1,000 Israeli shekels with the payment of the fine publicly transmitted also at the holiday party and the fines will be paid to the teacher, of the, uh, well, the fines will uh, support the Teacher of the Year celebration. And it closed with of course, sometimes it's impossible for reasons beyond your control to arrive on time, and should this occur, you may appeal your fine before a group of parents and staff in case unavoidable lateness or, uh, or if the fine would cause undue hardship, uh, and so on. Uh, now, that's about what the Greeks did. Remember, they even had a mechanism for making sure that the imposition on this was fair by this incredibly clever incentive-compatible thing of, uh, see, I can pick anybody else who should have been picked, so I'm going to obviously find the richest guy who wasn't selected, because I know it's making use of the information among the citizens, not assuming the state manager has the information. I'm going to pick the guy who is the most likely for me to win against, so he's got to take the ship and I don't have to. Um, and if he refuses, remember what happens? He, we exchange wealth. So, uh, you know, so that's also good, right? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, gee, I don't know why economics... Have we learned anything in economics? These guys, these guys knew everything that was in your public economics text. I mean, Lafont and, and Tyrol and these guys don't have anything on the Athenians. Anyway, that was, I would do something like that. Now, about the list, well, I did say if they're late, they have to pay their fine at the holiday party. Uh, and, um, you know, what do people think about that? I think, you know, uh, the idea of the shame of the prostitutes and so on, I, I objected that not because of the public shame. I object to it because of the prostitutes. That is, I, I don't think it's shameful to be a prostitute, and I think it's shameful to shame the prostitutes, but I don't think it's shameful to shame people who violate other social norms that are, that are uh, socially valuable. Now, the problem with shaming is you have to agree on what the values are. Not everybody in this room agrees with me that prostitution isn't shameful, probably. And many other things. We'd probably... You know, Thank you. Uh, I am not Athenian, I'm from Sparta, and I have a Greek accent, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to so tell me. Yeah. I am delighted to have how you present the example of Athenian democracy, but please remember it was very small. Each one, everyone uh, could knew, uh, mm -hmm. all citizens, they knew each other. So I like very much your presentation because it gives to us a lot of material to think at the level of education, at the level of incentives for teachers, because for many years we were thinking in teachers' incentives in terms of economic incentives. And when we are going to the field, we see that uh, even in the very poor conditions, human beings, teachers, work in the classroom without any economic incentive. They can improve the job because there are other internal incentives, moral, eth ethical. And this is very important to to put again in the table of the discussion around this uh, professional body. Thank you. Thank you. Room. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I noticed you used anonymity a couple times in the presentation and its role in crowding in or crowding out. And if I understood correctly, it had opposite, effect in opposite effects in different cases. In the Haifa case, you mentioned that because people, when parents show up to pick up the kids, they show up late, no one else is there. So the publicness doesn't have that sort of restraining effect that might promote crowding in. On the other hand, in the experiment in the public goods game where people could uh, contribute some of their own money to find someone, and then the groups were scrambled, you said it was the anonymity which then contributed to the fact that people felt that it wasn't they being personally pro you know, punished, but a, the construction of a general broad order or something like that. So I was just struck by how anonymity has seem to have different effects in, in those two cases, and I, I don't, I'm curious your thoughts why, and I was puzzling a little bit about it, and, and, and was wondering about how 
Um, in certain settings, it... Uh, well, I think it's a little bit related to what Chavi said. I think that, you know, the purpose in the lab setting was fairly clear, you know, that what this is being used for is fairly clear, whereas in this, it, whereas the purpose, if, the pur if the purpose of the fines wasn't explained, uh, the, the goal of this potential construction of a public order wasn't really clear to people, and so um, that may be important, and, and it makes me also finally just, you know, you, you sort of talk about the social, but it, maybe it's really the political, you know, because it's, 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 it's sort of, it needs to be explained and understood and publicized and, you know, and it, there's contestation about what it means. And I think that may affect how anonymity and impersonality, uh, what, what the direction of its effect in different settings. Uh, I, that's a very deep question. And I, 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 can't, I can't answer it adequately, but I can comment a little teeny bit around the edges. Uh, the, uh, the importance of anonymity uh, and the meaning of anonymity differs tremendously from culture to culture. Uh, one of the really striking things about modern liberal culture, which is, I mean, uh, uh, Europe, at least northern Europe, uh, North America, and so on, is that um, we're, uh, in experiments, typically, willing to impose fines on other people, and the people who are the subject of the fines, even though it was imposed anonymously, respond positively. Uh, to the, if they're doing some bad behavior, they correct it. Uh, that's not typical of other cultures. Uh, t typically, if you get fined by, uh, if you get punished, or uh, if you have some some bad thing happen to you by somebody who you don't know, uh, you respond negatively to that. Um, you respond hostily. So, for example, sometimes uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, punishment behavior in public goods games lead people to contribute less because they think, well, what kind of group is this? They're punishing me, uh, and. Um, uh, so I think the anonymity, I mean, I think when we think about anonymity and design of policies, we have to think of in which country are we working. Uh, the, uh, what, the reason why I call those societies liberal is because there is in, in those societies a tradition of about three centuries in which the imposition of law and the maintenance of the rule of law was done explicitly by people who were supposed to be anonymous. That is, by judges and police and so on. They, uh, they are, you, you don't know them. Uh, they're not a member of your family. They're not even a member of your group or your lineage. It's explicitly people who have a role, a bureaucratic role, in the sense that Weber would have said. And they're the ones who are maintaining law and order. That's not the way it is in a lot of societies. In a lot of societies, it would be your lineage. Uh, so that if, uh, if somebody from uh, your, your group uh, cheated me or cheated my uh, son, I wouldn't go to you to seek redress. I would have uh, my father or my uncle go to talk to uh, the head of your group and say, listen, you know, one of your people is cheating one of my people, and I hope you can deal with it. Uh, and uh, so the idea of being anonymously punished by an outsider is not okay in most societies, and that leads to trouble. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not making any judgments about which is a better way to run societies, but you better know what the, which it is if you're going to have situations in which you involve people who have no status engaging in uh, punishment. Uh, but I think the bottom line in the, in the thing that connects all of this is that if you're punishing or incentivizing and so on, the key thing is the legitimacy of the incentive or the punishment. It has to be legitimate in whatever the setting is. Now, in, in many societies, um, that, that involves discussion. And one of the things which I think is true uh, I think it's true both because of ob observing politics, but also doing experiments. Typically, when people discuss things face to face and they make eye contact and they give arguments to each other about what ought to happen, the, the results of those kinds of deliberations tend to be more public spirited, less selfish than situations in which you can take an action in private without providing reasons. And the reason for that is that people actually are pretty good. People are awkward about claiming a whole lot if they don't have a good reason. So I might walk away with three quarters of the pie if I could do it in some way without interacting with you. But for me to go to you and make eye contact with you and say, I'm really sorry, but I think I deserve three quarters of this pie, that's a lot harder. And people don't do it. Uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why you have right-left differences about whether or not uh, the questions of the distribution of the pie should be handled in public by states or handled in private by markets. 
Uh, and uh, I think if you want to preserve your wealth, you have to hope that it's all done basically in an anonymous way. And if you want to redistribute income, it should be on the table for discussion. Uh, now, I don't know if that's true, but I think there could be some truth to what I just said. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, and if it is, then that's part of a strategy, isn't it? It's provide arenas in which people provide reasons for whatever it is they're doing. Uh, that may, it means you're, you're trusting that people are pretty good and will have a hard time being insincere in those settings, if it's their neighbors. Daniel. Um, it's about a, a comment you made on a previous question about what is it that you're testing. Say you're told of a, a randomized control trial where the decision was would people provide more of service A if instead of just paying them a salary, you pay them a fee every time they do it? And the, and the answer is yes or no. Now, it's in the yes or no, if I understood what you said before, there may be three different things that lead to that. One is whether incentives, we're having the problem of incentives, you, you began by talking. Another one is that it may well be that there isn't really consensus about whether doing more of activity A is good for the children. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of donors, say, in this country who happen to disagree. And by deciding this is the experiment and putting a price to it, you're saying, okay, this is, the, this is now the consensus view. Mm -hmm. so, so it's about information. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the third one is, has to do with do we have common values? Mm -hmm. And uh, in some clinics in some parts of the world, uh, you know, being absent is a bad thing. It seems that in others, we're paid so poorly and everybody else is so corrupt around me that nobody really expects me to not be absent. And suddenly, by paying this, you're, you're also trying to influence on the values. So, would you agree with this? Yeah, I, th I think all of those things go on in, in, uh, in real life and also in any experiment which you run. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge problem with uh, interpreting any evidence like that, because you don't know which of those things it is. Uh, Hi. Um, today we talked a lot about negative incentives, um, using, incent using fines to deter people from doing something. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you would say similar to positive incentives as well. So giving rewards to, to push people into doing something, would you say um, you would, um, ev is there evidence on crowding out effects on that as well? Great question. Yes, there is. There's evidence on it. And uh, um, th think about the, the mechanisms. Uh, the, uh, if, if, if you're giving me a reward for good behavior, then the, the, uh, some of the bad news uh, problem goes away, because you're being nice to me. But it may be also that you don't trust I'd do it uh, of my own accord. But, so the bad news is probably attenuated a little bit. Uh, the moral disengagement can still be there. Whether it, you know, in fact, almost all the experiments about moral disengagement originally from psychology were from positive incentives. Uh, if you pay kids to paint the next day, they want to do something else they don't want to paint. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, that I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of the framework which I have. Now, th there are lots of experiments using both uh, uh, positive and negative incentives. The crowding out effects on the positive seem to be less. It's not a very robust finding, but I think you're on the right track to ask the question because. It's probably true that uh, they're, they're less. We'd like to know why, because I've given you a couple of mechanisms where it could be working or not. Uh, and um, uh, I think that's, that, you know, that's just something we don't, we don't know a whole lot about. Uh, as, as I said, uh, it is um, perhaps not a good sign about um, the way economic research is conducted that we spend a lot of time uh, just figuring out that people were not entirely selfish and we weren't asking the kinds of questions that you just asked me, uh, which is, okay, well, well, then what should we do? I mean, should we you know, abandon negative uh, incentives but keep the positive ones or do something else, uh, you know, et cetera? Final question. Just uh, when you talk about incentives, 
kind of like the payoffs that come out of these incentives, they're somehow predictable or, and fixed. Mm -hmm. So there's like some studies on gambling that they'll say, well, it's actually the variability or the unpredictability that payoffs that sometimes make pe people engage in, let's say, more desired behavior. My question is, are there any experiments kind of like showing effects of maybe, I don't know, of a lottery as opposed to every time instead of like getting $10 out of a behavior, peop people will randomly be assigned $100 or something like this? Uh, well, uh, there aren't exactly, but because a lot of researchers are underfunded, uh, people have done it inadvertently and it's in, the, in the following. Uh, when, what's called the strategy method when we do an experiment is, uh, you know, uh, we say, well, if, if, if this guy transfers me $5, will you accept or reject? And then they also ask if he does four, three, two, one, because we want to accumulate the information of the entire schedule. And then, of course, the guy has actually done one of these things, right? He hasn't done all the rest. So, uh, so the strategy method is accumulating a lot of information about what the person would do in situations which he doesn't know if they're going to occur, because he doesn't know what the guy did already. So. The the guys the other guys movement is like nature's move in a in a uh, in a uncertainty problem. So we can generate a lot of information like that. Now, okay. So the answer to the question is, surprisingly, it doesn't seem to make uh, a, a lot of difference whether or not it's certain or uncertain. Now, again, there's not enough evidence. We don't really know. Uh, and the people, by the way, a lot of the people who are finding these things are th like myself, themselves behavioral economists. And there's been a very strong tendency, I think, among behavioral economists, of course, to be pretty enthusiastic about our results and think they're pretty robust. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do in, uh, in really nailing down whether or not uncertain rewards are really different from certain ones. And the fact that we have inadvertently produced some evidence which seems to be consistent with it not making much of a difference, because that way we can get a lot more information for a given budget on the experiments. I mean. Given the fact that we're now playing in the big time and not just around the edges of the discipline, you know, we've got to, we've got to nail those things down. Well, uh, we need to come to closure. And uh, I want to thank Sam for a uh, really wonderful presentation, uh, an excellent paper, uh, and, uh, and a wonderful presentation. As I think it, it probably has become... Uh, when I, I had to convince Sam to, to come, uh, and he several times asked me why would people... Uh, be interested? Why would this audience be interested in this in, in this line of work? And uh, I argue, and I think the the questions you got today confirm that that it, essentially the kind of, of of issues that you're dealing with in in this paper and that this literature focuses on are really permeate uh, practically everything that we do. Uh, certainly in the human development uh, areas in the bank, but beyond. Uh, to the extent that actually we are trying to, uh, the outcomes that we're targeting require changes in, in behaviors. Uh, and given that we are, to a great extent, uh, uh, an organization that uh, is driven by economic uh, thinking, um, the, there is a natural tendency to go back to the old-fashioned, uh, eh, almost economics, uh, economic uh, uh, eh, model, uh, and it's very important, I believe, uh, to bring this new uh, type of literature and the research that you talked about today to inform uh, our work. So thanks a lot. But thanks to all let, of you. Let me ask you a favor. Uh, the reason why I said yes was because I'm having difficulty writing the last chapter. Uh, of, I've, I got a great title, and I have a pretty interesting coda. But the last chapter, which is... Okay, you can write journal articles and present interesting models and evidence. You cannot write a book without having a last chapter which is about what are the policy implications of this or something like that. As you can tell by my reticence about all of these things, uh, I, I would be very, very uh, grateful for any criticisms, suggestions, uh, accounts of interventions that you know about that may have uh, shed some light on this. I really, I really need help, and I really will uh, use whatever you, whatever you send. I mean, I'll, I will read it carefully, and I'll communicate with you because, uh, I, I mean, this the, this is very, very important stuff, and I think it's important for people to understand it. And uh, I will try very hard to write a good last chapter of the book, uh, and I can only do that with the help of people who know more than I know. 
So thank you very much. Mm.